Well, a warm welcome as always. It's actually Sunday the 10th of May. Now, I've had numerous questions about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Is it any good? Now, I've actually um, taken a step back and hung off from answering this question up until now because the quality of the data has been poor. There were a couple of studies from China that showed there might be some efficacy, that it might be of some benefit. And then there was a French study, but the French study was actually quite flawed for various reasons. So there was nothing really to uh, to hang your hat on with hydroxychloroquine. I think that that's true up until now. So I want to talk about that today, and I want to look through a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, there's lots of interesting stuff in this paper about hydroxychloroquine and, and other things like research methods and, and other aspects about this disease. But if you want to skip this video, I won't be offended. The bottom line is it doesn't work unfortunately. And, and this, is, this is an immensely disappointing finding because uh, hydroxychloroquine is relatively safe. Okay, there's toxic effects with any drugs. If you take too much, you can affect the heart and things. But it's a reasonably well-tolerated drug at the right dose in most people. And it's dirt cheap. It's off license. It's off, it's off patent. It's off copyright. So, you know, we would have made tons of it for, for, for virtually nothing. So it's a great pity. But the bottom line is it doesn't really work, so uh, there's no evidence of efficacy from this study. So there you go, that's the bottom line if you want to skip that. But um, it is interesting if you want to stick with it. So um, stick with it to, to get, get lots of other interesting bits and bobs. Now, <clears throat> it's an observational study. Now, these aren't as good as randomised double-blind controlled trials, but it's the best we've got at the moment. It's the best quality study in my view at the moment. So it's an ob observational study of hydroxychloroquine, and this is in hospitalised patients with COVID-19. And it's straight out the New England Journal of Medicine three days ago. New England Journal of Medicine, very prestigious journal, medical journal, 7th of May. So this is bang up to date stuff. Always you'll be given the reference so you can check for yourself. Don't just accept what I'm saying. Go to the original source and see if what I'm saying is true. Now, the background to this is hydroxychloroquine is uh, widely used without any robust evidence. So quite a lot of people have been using this, but um, the evidence for it's always been weak. So is it reasonable that a drug that's been used for malaria and rheumatoid arthritis all of a sudden should be effective against COVID-19? Why the heck should that be? Well, actually, this isn't unusual in, in pharmacology. It's actually quite common that drugs are repurposed for different indications. So an indication is why you give the drug. So, for example, aspirin was first developed for fever, and then they realised it treated pain as well. And then they realised it, uh, it stopped the uh, platelets in the blood from sticking together, so it can prevent things like strokes. So these extra things. So aspirin is now commonly used to prevent what we call thromboembolic disease, like, like, like strokes. <coughs> but it's, um, it wasn't developed, developed for that. It was initially developed for something else. Or Viagra, you've probably heard of Viagra. Now, Viagra was actually developed for treating angina. That's the pain from the heart caused by poor blood supply to the heart muscle, to the myocardium. So it was developed to treat angina and high blood pressure. But then it was found to have a particular side effect in men. And it's used to uh, enhance that particular side effect in men now. Or gabapentin was another one. G gabapentin was originally developed for epilepsy. And then people found it was very good at treating some sorts of pain. Or tricyclic antidepressants that were developed for anti, for, as, as antidepressants. These, um, do, these are the old-fashioned, uh, more old-fashioned antidepressants. They are still used. But the tricyclic antidepressants were used to treat depression for many years. Uh, still are, but but now it was found that they help with what's called neuropathic pain. So they're good for pain as well. Uh, statins, originally developed to lower cholesterol, and it seems they're good at reducing inflammation. And um, some people claim benefits in treating things like multiple sclerosis. So it's not it's not ludicrous that, that um, one pharmaceutical is is repurposed for another another indication. So um, and. Hydroxychloroquine was a good guess, really, 
because it is anti-inflammatory and it does have some antiviral properties. Now, we don't want people getting this um, acute inflammatory syndrome that you can get with as a complication of COVID-19. This uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is inflammatory. So it kind of makes sense that anti-inflammatory is good. And of course, antiviral is, is, is it's a viral illness. So if, if it affects the uh, correct, can kill the coronavirus in some way, wonderful. So it, it was reasonable that, that it would be... Um, it, would, it may have some efficacy. It's not, it's not a silly thing to try. And uh, people at a very high political level strongly advocated this drug as well. But the trouble is we, we, need, we need robust evidence. But given that there was some anecdotal evidence that this may work from the French studies and from some early Chinese trials, which weren't well done with small numbers, but there was some sort of glimmer of hope that it may work. So the Food and Drug Administration in the United States authorised um, emergency use on the 30th of March. So people have been using it, uh, particularly in the United States, not so much in the UK, it has to be said. But also France, it's been used quite a bit. So how was this studied? What were the research methods? Well, the researchers examined the association between hydroxychloroquine use and respiratory failure, which of course is one of the main causes of death in complicated COVID-19 disease. In fact, is the main, the main cause of death in COVID-19 disease. And um, what they did was they looked at the association between giving the hydrochloroquine and someone's respiratory status deteriorating to the point where they needed to be intubated. That's the breathing tube down the throat or a tracheostomy made in the neck. Or, or they died. So if people were given hydroxychloroquine, did that reduce the likelihood that they needed to be intubated for mechanical respiratory support? Or did it reduce the chances that they would die? That is, that is the question. That is the research question. Now, this was carried out at um, the New York Presbyterian Hospital uh, in association with Columbia University medical center so it's it's a well-known prestigious center and they recruited a large number of patients so the initial n the number in the study 1446 now that's a good number you can get good data from those kind of numbers and all the patients they recruited were positive for the antigen on pcr testing <clears throat> so all these patients did have the uh the covid19 virus so they were all positive for the virus. And then they simply compared the outcomes. Well, not quite as simple, but they compared the outcomes of people given hydroxychloroquine and those that weren't. So some were prescribed hydroxychloroquine, some weren't. It wasn't done for the purposes of this research. It was just done. So they looked at it just to observe what was going on to see if there was a, a benefit. And they, could, they did find out there was these two groups those that had the hydroxychloroquine and those that didn't. And the hydroxychloroquine was indicated according to their current guidelines in moderate to severe respiratory illness. So some of the patients with moderate to severe respiratory illness were giving hydroxychloroquine, others were not. And the moderate to severe respiratory illness was defined as oxygen saturations of less than 94% on room air. So we like people's oxygen saturations to be above 94%. And uh, this was defined by people whose oxygen saturations had dropped below 94%. So quite reasonable, quite reasonable um, criteria. Now, what were the results that they found? Well, they were able to use 1,376 patients. Now, the initial number was slightly higher, but a few patients were discharged out and a few patients died before the baseline of the study. So, but this still left 1,376 patients, and this is a very good cohort size. So there's absolutely no reason why a very valid analysis cannot be taken from these kind of numbers. Now... They recruited from the 7th of March through to the 8th of April 2020. 
and they followed up these patients up until the 25th of April 2020. So patients recruited 7th of March to the 8th of April but followed up till the 25th of April. And of this original sample size of the 1376 patients, 811 were given hydroxychloroquine. That's almost 60% of the sample. But of course, that left 40% that didn't get it, which is ideal because they form a comparison group, the group that didn't get hydroxychloroquine. Now, of this original sample of 1,000 376, 346 patients developed respiratory failure. So of this group that were being followed up, 346 actually developed respiratory failure. So that means what? Just over a thousand didn't. But the ones that did develop respiratory failure is 25% of that sample. So again, it's a good group of patients. You can do good quantitative analysis on these numbers. And of the 346, 180 needed to be intubated and 166 died. Both of which, according to the criteria of this study, and I'm sure you would agree, represent a bad outcome, an adverse outcome. Because we know that quite a high proportion of the patients that are intubated go on to die later, unfortunately. And there was no significant association between hydroxychloroquine use and intubation or death. So in other words, if you had hydroxychloroquine, you were just as likely to be intubated or just as likely to die as if you didn't have it. It wasn't doing anything. Now, the team give a rather good graphic that helps us to uh, understand that. So let's just look at that now. Now, here's the graphic the team produced, and we see the green line is patients that were not given hydroxychloroquine, and the red line is the patients that were given hydroxychloroquine. These are days along the bottom here of treatment, from 0 to 30 days. And this up here is the probability of being event free. So of course you want to be event free because the events were death or intubation. So this is a good desired result, meaning that the patient was not intubated and did not die and this was the worst possible result down here. Now what we see here is there's an interesting kind of a crossover about there. So round about there, interesting. So what we see for the group that were given hydroxychloroquine, initially they were slightly better off. For about, what, the first nine days, they were very slightly better off. Very minimal effect. But after that, they were actually more likely to suffer an adverse event, such as being intubated or dying. So what we see compared to the green line that didn't have the hydroxychloroquine, we see that initially there was some marginal benefit but then there was a marginal detriment after that in other words an unwanted event was more likely here in this bit here if they were treated so what conclusions do we draw from this well giving hydroxychloroquine was not associated with either a greatly lowered or an increased risk of intubation or death. In other words, it didn't make too much difference actually. Because the differences between these lines here aren't really significant. They're so close together that they're not really significant. Although we did notice a marginal detriment in patients that were treated with hydroxychloroquine after a cutoff point of about nine days. But basically it's saying the difference is not significant. It's not a big difference. It's not big enough to, to really mean anything. So um, findings uh, do not support the use of hydroxychloroquine at present. But they do make an exception that if there was to be a randomised clinical trial 
then it would be reasonable to use it in a randomised clinical trial. But until then, there's no therapeutic evidence that this is working. So at this large New York centre, clinical guidance at our medical centre has been updated to remove the suggestion that patients be treated with hydroxychloroquine if they have COVID-19 disease. So in other words, they're removing the suggestion to treat COVID-19 patients with hydroxychloroquine from their guidelines as a result of this study offering no evidence of efficacy. Now, one question that did come to my mind here was, were patients treated with hydroxychloroquine more ill when they were given the treatment? Because if hydroxychloroquine was given selectively to patients that were iller, it's not surprised if those patients it's not surprising if those patients did worse. So it turns out that the team had actually accounted for this possibility that the patients that were given hydroxychloroquine were more sick at the start of the study, therefore more likely to die. So they adjusted for these likely confounders. The con a confounder is anything that could mess up the results, basically. Like the patients who were given hydrochloroquine being more ill at the, uh, at the start of the study. And they used some very clever uh, statistical techniques to do this, which I don't pretend to fully understand. But uh, they, they are peer-reviewed and they are very effective statistical techniques. So they were able to account for age because we know that older people get more severe disease and are more likely to get complications and die. They did account for race and ethnic group because we know that African Americans, for example, get more complications and more death than white Americans. They did account for body mass index because very thin people do seem to do well and people with increasing body mass index, people that are increasingly obese, do do worse. So they accounted for that. They accounted for diabetes, which we know makes the outcome worse. They accounted for chronic kidney disease and chronic lung disease, both of which we know makes the outcome worse. Quite a few patients were found to be hypertensive, high blood pressure. And we know that's definitely associated with a worse outcome. So they accounted for that. And this is the most important thing to my mind, really. They accounted for the baseline vital signs. So they realised that some people were sicker at the start, but they accounted for that. They accounted for the amount of oxygen therapy, uh, oxygen therapy people were requiring to maintain their oxygen saturations. They detected for the overall amount of inflammation in the body, as indicated by inflammatory markers. So they accounted for an awful lot of things. Now, that doesn't exclude the possibility that um, there may be... Uh, unmeasured confounding variables remaining but they uh, accounted for all of the obvious things so the bottom line here is this study indicates to me that this is a genuine result and that unfortunately they're readily available relatively well tolerated very cheap drug hydroxychloroquine appears to have no efficacious effect in reducing the likelihood of intubation and death in patients with respiratory failure in COVID-19 disease. Won't pretend not to be disappointed, but uh, that's what the evidence is showing. Now, if there's a sophisticated double-blind randomised controlled trial that reverses this, that would be great. But this paper doesn't give us uh, a lot of hope that that would be the case. Is it still right to trial it? Of course. Um, but so far, as of today, we have no evidence of efficacy as indicated by this study.